every day we are faced with life and death situations, like this one, in which every second counts. Unfortunately, all too often, amidst the adrenaline rush of the emergency department setting, the textbook process of organization and effective resuscitations quickly disintegrates into chaos. Purposeful chaos, but chaos nevertheless. Although in a code or resuscitation process, time is of crucial importance, quality of care is equally important. We believe that an organized code process is the key to providing both quality care and timely intervention. Planning your resuscitation processes in advance can help minimize the problems which might occur while the heat is on in the emergency department. <laughs> to that end, this video is developed to improve quality of care and efficiency in hospitals code situations. We intend to show you how to organize and implement a more effective resuscitation plan. First, we'll look at a disorganized resuscitation scenario in order to identify some of the problems we would like to avoid. Then, we'll talk about systems of resuscitation organization. These systems will help you break down the overall code process into more easily manageable periods of time. Next, we'll offer some tips for preventing disorganized resuscitations through effective leadership and team organization. Finally, we'll demonstrate an effective resuscitation process utilizing the principles we've discussed. By the way, the principles we're discussing apply to both the resuscitation in the emergency department as well as a code run on any unit in your institution. To save time, we'll use the words code and resuscitation interchangeably. Now let's have a look at a disorganized code scenario. See if you recognize any of these situations from your own experience. Here, hold this. I already have one here. Jeez. Okay. It's a joke. 
I hope there's no lawyers sitting out there. Did any of that look familiar? I expect we've all been guilty of committing a few of the mistakes we just saw. Fortunately, being better organized can help us streamline the resuscitation scenario and avoid making mistakes. One step toward providing the highest quality patient care during resuscitation involves understanding and implementing the three different systems of code organization. By breaking down the resuscitation process into component phases, we are more easily able to fine tune our practices during each one. Much of what we present here may be new, but if any of it seems familiar, that's good. It means we're speaking the same language, and part of being better organized means more clearly defining activities with which we're already familiar. And remember, even though we'll be discussing code organization, watch for related principles of team leadership and performance as well. As I've already said, there are three perspectives from which to view the processes of resuscitation organization. The patient's view, your emergency team's view, and the global overview. The patient organizational view is patient-oriented. That is, it broadly outlines the process of patient care from the patient's perspective. Every phase of the patient organizational view focuses on the needs of the patient. The component phases of the patient organizational view are the pre-hospital phase, during which the patient is identified, triaged, treated, and transferred from the field. During this period of time, historical and observational data is collected from the pre-hospital providers in the field. And in the emergency department, you'll be preparing for the patient's arrival. In the primary survey, the patient's physiologic status is assessed by reviewing the patient's ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposing the patient. The primary survey may take only a minute and usually occurs at the same time as the next phase, the patient resuscitation phase. During the resuscitation phase, emergency interventions and procedures are accomplished. Once the most urgent resuscitative procedures have been accomplished, the secondary survey, our fourth phase, may be performed. This is an anatomic survey, a thorough head-to-toe examination of the patient's body. Finally, the fifth phase of the patient organizational view is the definitive care phase. Now, more definitive emergency care occurs. This may include further studies, such as a CT scan, rapid transport to the operating suite, or admission for observation. As you can see, knowing and understanding the elements of each phase can help us to organize and mentally structure patient care throughout the overall resuscitation process. It can also help us pinpoint specific elements which may need improvement. Although our ultimate goal is, of course, quality patient care, the next perspective of this code organization process, the team organizational view, moves the spotlight from the patient to you, the emergency team member. It provides a more detailed look at the same processes as the patient organizational view through the eyes of the emergency team. It further defines team activities during the resuscitation process. Note that each phase of the team organizational view includes time-sensitive priorities. During the anticipation phase, the pre-hospital data is received and analyzed. Subsequently, your team is gathered, leadership is established, roles or duties are delegated, a room preparation checklist is utilized, the equipment is prepared and checked, and your team members position themselves in readiness for the arrival of the critically ill patient. Good organization here can make all the difference in how well your team performs. The entry phase involves the orderly transfer of the patient to the emergency department stretcher. Report is given with the most current vital signs and patient status update. During the resuscitation phase, your team assesses the patient's ABCs and carries out any indicated resuscitative interventions. 
it is especially important at this point to have strong physician and nursing leadership. The physician leadership should be a single, dominant voice, with nursing leadership effectively delegating the orders. Communication should be continuous and bi-directional. Other team members should provide clear communication to the team leadership. During resuscitation, while procedures are performed and medications are administered, vital signs must be obtained every five minutes. If the interventions of the resuscitative phase don't produce an improvement in the patient's condition, your team will repeat the primary or physiologic survey. Hopefully, however, the patient's condition has shown improvement, and you will proceed to the secondary or anatomical survey. As in every phase, clear communication is the key to successful code organization. After the major assessment and resuscitative procedures have been accomplished, your team moves into the maintenance phase. Simply stated, this involves continued stabilization of the patient and adjustments in life support equipment, as well as securing lines and tubes. Now that the most critical interventions have been completed, your team's adrenaline rush may subside. It is important not to let your team's attention subside as well. The family notification phase is not really a single period in time, but instead occurs regularly throughout the resuscitation process. Because the patient's family is understandably concerned about the patient's welfare, one member of your team should be designated to act as the family liaison. Frequent, honest status reports and information updates are important to family members and should be carried out with sensitivity. We all recognize this as more than just a courtesy. It's a humane thing to do. As with the notification phase, the transfer phase does not necessarily occur at the end of a resuscitation. In fact, making arrangements for transfer of the patient may be critically important. Transfer must, therefore, be considered early on in the resuscitation process. For example, in the case of amputated limbs, timely transfer to the proper facility may mean the difference between successful reattachment and failure. Arranging for transport late into a resuscitation is not efficient management of the patient's health condition. The transfer process may involve moving the patient to an intensive care unit setting or to another hospital with tertiary care facilities. Be sure to communicate with the receiving units or facilities well in advance of the patient's anticipated transfer. Because every resuscitation is different, your team should perform a specific code critique immediately after every resuscitation. The critique phase allows us to examine the patient care delivered, as well as assess how effectively the team performed. This allows maximal educational benefit from the resuscitation experience and can help us avoid repeating mistakes with future patients. Debriefing or diffusing processes can also occur during the critique phase, allowing team members to begin to manage personal grief reactions. The final perspective on code organization, the global overview, incorporates both the patient and team perspectives. It is important because it provides an overview of the complete patient care process. The global overview takes into account the patient's progression from the pre-hospital environment into the resuscitation phase, primarily spent in the emergency department, transitioning to the restoration phase, the acute care component, and finally into the rehabilitation phase, which culminates in the patient's discharge home. Because the global overview covers such a broad range of activities, we won't discuss it in any great detail in this application-based video. The material is, however, covered thoroughly in the accompanying training guide. Obviously, merely understanding the code organization process is not enough, although attention to the various phases of the process are important organizational tools. Without the cooperation of individual team members combined with strong leadership, effective code organization will be a difficult achievement at best. 
Because they are so important to code organization then, let's take a few moments to look at the concepts of teams and leaders in the emergency department. Anyone who has ever been involved with both knows there is quite a difference between a team and a group. While a group is made up of individuals who may not cooperate with one another, team members do not compete against one another. Instead, their energies are combined and directed toward achieving a common goal. And while a particular member of a group may stand out from the rest, team members don't steal the spotlight but present a unified effort in achieving their mission. Finally, while a group may be characterized by infighting and backstabbing, a team fosters a sense of mutual trust. Clearly, an emergency department team must be just that, a team, working toward the common goal of providing life-saving care for the patient. The emergency team is like an auto racing pit crew with each team member responsible for a separate activity which will contribute to the success of the team as a whole. There is one other important element which every team must include to perform to its highest potential, a leader. Your team needs a designated leader to take overall responsibility for organizing the patient's care, to coordinate and manage the team of specialists and technicians, and to ensure that all services are aligned to the same patient treatment plan. Your team must recognize and accept that strong team leadership is a necessity. But the reverse is also true. A strong leader must recognize the importance and value of his or her team members and treat them with the respect that they deserve. Of course, the leader must also have the respect of the team. And a degree of that respect will be gained by establishing authority itself. Leadership will typically belong to the senior physician, but there are a number of other methods which can be effective in letting them know you're in charge. The team captain should be in the resuscitation room and assemble the team prior to the patient's arrival. The physician and nursing leadership guide the team in planning the patient's care and assigning roles and responsibilities. Be sure to clarify the nursing leadership. Position yourself initially at the head of the bed, a typical position for team leaders. It may be necessary to inform the team to take orders only from you. Elicit and record the patient's history yourself. Enforce and utilize the team structure. In other words, use your team efficiently. Make eye contact and address team members by name whenever possible. Once you've established your leadership though, your job is not quite over. Unfortunately, it's easier to be called a leader than to actually lead. It is important to maintain your leadership position because confusion over team leadership will negatively affect patient care. Here are some actions that you can employ to prevent the loss of clear leadership. Credibility counts. You must be qualified and well-versed in resuscitation priorities. Speed is also important. Be quick and efficient in giving orders. Be quick to intercept infringements on your role as a leader. No one should assume your role. Immediately, but compassionately, correct all team errors. Be aggressive in treating the patient when it is appropriate. Don't be timid. Always maintain both a sense of composure and a sense of humor. Always compliment the team for good work. This builds good team relationships. Now that you've established and maintained your leadership position, you still have to get the job done. And there's no more effective tool for efficiency in the emergency department than clear communication. Here then are a few rules to follow to get your message across to your team members. Be the single clear voice of command. Set the pace. Lead the team by communicating as quickly and efficiently as necessary. As the team leader, communicate through your chain of command. Give orders to the leaders 
then let him or her delegate. Orders should be given to specific individuals. Don't just broadcast general orders. Also, remember to make eye contact and address team members by name. Carry on a continuous conversation, providing ongoing information to your team. As the leader, you should encourage questions and suggestions to further improve team communication. As you can see, being a code team leader is no easy job. Now we hope you haven't forgotten our earlier discussion of systems of resuscitation organization, because this is where we combine the two. Here are a few more pointers, especially for leaders in helping code organization during procedures. Don't allow specific procedures to distract from the global resuscitation picture. In other words, don't forget the forest for the trees. Use a room checklist to ensure that the resuscitation room is ready prior to the patient's arrival. Be sure that your resuscitation equipment is ready and working prior to the patient's arrival. Unless no one else is available, the team leader should generally not perform procedures. If the team leader must perform a procedure, temporarily designate another leader. When consultants perform procedures, don't allow them to distract from the overall resuscitation organization. Open and prepare equipment and adequate supplies to prevent unnecessary delays. Believe it or not, it is possible to include all of the elements we've discussed in your own code organization plan. In fact, we'll demonstrate this by showing you how much more effectively your resuscitation scenario runs when an organized plan has been implemented. This organized resuscitation utilizes the principles we have discussed over the last few minutes. Ben, you're taking care of the manual blood pressure? Yes, I am. Okay. Right Dr. Thomas, have you x-rayed this leg yet? Uh, Dr. Thomas, I'm the code no captain here, and we are working on the airway right now in our primary survey. We'll get to that in our secondary, okay? Okay. Thank you. Uh, again, so again, second line work done right now. Katrina, we need uh, uh, trauma labs, okay? We have high flow oxygen. It could be a sister ventilation sure. right now, please. I'm drawing bloods right now. Call x -ray, make sure they're ready, and make sure blood bank is ready. I'll take that. Can you call x-ray please, Terry, and get blood down here from blood bank, please? Um, let's go ahead and get x-ray in. Um, what is our updated blood pressure? Updated blood pressure is 118 over 71. X-rays on their way. Okay, good. Uh, we need to uh, think now about um, two dams of ANSA, uh, DT, um, and any old records that we can get on the patient. And let's check to see if they have any family in the lobby. Call the secretary okay. when old records and try to get the family in the unit. And we'll also um, need to uh, think about putting the splint on the There's really a lot of demand. Let's go ahead and um, uh, put a pressure dressing there, like some direct pressure. Dr. Thomas, can you give me a pressure dressing, please, for this one? Let, um, let's go ahead and get the ABG. Okay. okay. And our full energy. I'm going to get into right here, right between the legs. And we're going to get now. Okay. 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 We're ready for transport. 
Um, review our resuscitation here and see if there's ways that we could uh, do this better. How do you think everything went? Uh, everything went pretty smooth. Uh, everyone kept uh, uh, low tone as far as uh, uh, not talking. We were basically the captain and we uh, basically ran it. And people talked around the bedside here, the more organized. I thought that uh, we could have kept the patient a little bit more warm with the warming wax. Well, there you have it. Quite an improvement over the first resuscitation, isn't it? Although we may not all achieve such a dramatic difference in our resuscitation organizations overnight, it is still possible to make significant changes almost immediately by following these four steps. Gain an overall knowledge of and approach to the systems of code organization. Assemble your code team and define roles and responsibilities prior to the patient's arrival. Use a room preparation checklist before the patient's arrival. Understand and utilize the concepts of team leadership, performance, and communication we have discussed. From the largest medical center emergency department to the smallest regional hospital care unit, the principles of code organization as we have just outlined them apply in any setting. Though in a smaller facility where you may not have all of the resources shown in this video, it is important that you have a clear plan. Examine the resources you have available and use them to your best advantage as you plan your resuscitation code organization. For more detailed information concerning the concepts and systems of code organization, please consult the training guide provided with this video. Thank you.